Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 APS user meeting. My name is Michelle Mejia, and I'm the chair for the APS user executive committee. On behalf of the APS user executive committee, we'd like to thank you for joining us for the 2023 APS user meeting. Uh, we have some great speakers and sessions scheduled for this year. In addition to some wonderful technical sessions and talks that we have scheduled, I'd like to invite you to our UEC town hall. Um, where the user committee will be available to answer any questions or concerns you may have. That will be held Thursday afternoon at 2.30 p.m., as well as two diversity, equity, and inclusion sessions that we have scheduled for Wednesday and Thursday p.m. at 1 p.m. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll go ahead and kick off this combined plenary session. First, I'd like to welcome Argonne National Lab Director Paul Kearns to give a few words. Thank you very, very much, Michelle. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the APS CNM user meeting. Great occasion. Uh, you're helping us improve the services and capabilities of these two premier U.S. Department of Energy user facilities, the Advanced Photon Source and the Center for Nanoscale Materials, along with our other three uh, Office of Science user facilities, play an integral role in both Argonne and the Department of Energy mission. At these facilities, you help expand the scientific and technological frontiers that ensure America's and the world's energy future. We really appreciate your participation today. Thank you for being here again. After years of careful planning and thoughtful preparation, the advanced photon source has begun its year long shutdown to complete the APS upgrade. User operations at the advanced photon source ended today, and we will shut the accelerator down next week. The APS has transitioned from a scientific user facility to an active construction site. We are well on our way to building the next generation hard X-ray light source at Argonne. Over the next year, we will remove the current storage ring and replace it with a brand new state-of-the-art system. Every experiment station will be improved, some significantly, and we'll construct a series of first-class stations so you can take full advantage of the beams that will be up to 500 times brighter. After the upgraded APS returns to operations, in 2024, it will offer world leading. It will offer a world leading X ray facility for the entire scientific community. Not only are we upgrading the APS, but across campus at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, we're building one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Aurora will be an exascale computer capable of delivering more than two exaflops of computing power. Another way to state that it's more than two billion billion calculations per second. It will be 100 times faster than the current systems at the ALCF. The upgraded APS, as you're aware, will generate enormous quantities of data that can be fed directly to Aurora. Their co-location at Argonne means they can exchange data practically instantaneously, working as an integrated tool for science. We look forward to welcoming all of you back next year when both the upgraded APS and the Aurora supercomputer are online and ready to empower your research. In the meantime, the Center for Nanoscale Materials will continue to operate. In fact, last November, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of the center. Here is some recent CNM news. Uh, over the past year, CNM hosted 750 users from 36 states, uh, plus the District of Columbia, and 12 countries. Of those 700 and plus users, more than half conducted research on site. An exciting recent addition to the CNM is the set of automated robotics combined with artificial intelligence and machine learning for autonomous discovery. This new capability allows synthesis, processing, and the characterization of materials for scientific breakthroughs. This and other new capabilities at the CNM are keeping a facility on the cutting edge of nanoscience and technology. I'm also pleased to report that in FY22, uh, users and staff cited CNM research in 289 scientific papers. Of these, more than half appeared in high-impact journals. Highlights from our CNM staff include one paper in Nature Communications on a new method for introducing spinning electrons as qubits in a host uh, nanomaterial, which are apl applicable to quantum information technologies. In a paper just published in the Journal of, Ameri of the American Chemical Society, a team co-led by CNM staff reported on telomerase uh, activated MRI probe that could be used for cancer diagnost 
diagnosis, uh, treatment assessment, and drug screening. Before I hand things off to Laura, I want to express my gratitude to our keynote speaker, Linda Horton. Linda, it's great to have you here today. Linda is the Associate Director of Science at the DOE Office of Basic Sciences. We couldn't provide the equipment and support of these user facilities without Linda's leadership and the support of the Office of Science. Our collaborative partnership with basic energy science programs and the user community enables some pivotal discoveries. I also want to recognize our other keynote speaker, Thomas Fitzgibbons, a senior R&D leader at the Dow Chemical Company. Our collaboration with Dow, longstanding, exemplifies our industrial partnerships. Together, we are solving technical challenges, enhancing equipment, uh, enhancing development rather, and introducing transformative innovations to the marketplace. Lastly, we're grateful to have Dava Kivye, Kivne, sorry, a DOE Office of uh, a DOE Office of Science Program Manager for X-ray Light Sources. Her support of the Advanced Photon Source is crucial, and we're looking forward to her talk at the APO Symposium. So thank you again for participating. Your work will help accelerate the science and technology that drive U.S. prosperity. I wish all of you uh, an engaging and very productive meeting. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Paul. Now we'll hand it over to Laurent, who is the Associate Laboratory Director, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Paul. It's uh, definitely a super exciting time to be a Targon and uh, also an exciting time to be a user uh, of the uh, facilities that are Targon, even though I understand that, you know, for the, as far as the APS is concerned, the next few months would be without being that, uh, you know, very soon you will have improved capabilities at Targon that will be accessible. So uh, bear with us, we will make this happen. And it's uh, Certainly very exciting. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Linda Houghton. Uh, Dr. Houghton is the Associate Director for Science for Basic Energy Science in the Department of Energy. As you know, BS is uh, responsible for a very large portfolio uh, in fundamental research and a very large budget as well, over $2 billion. Uh, and so Linda oversees three divisions, material science and engineering, chemical sciences, geoscience and biosciences, and also the scientific user facility division. So, you know, all together, the light sources, the neutron sources, SNS and IFER uh, at Oak Ridge and the nano centers, all of these facilities are welcoming more than 16,000 users every year. So it's really one of the um, jewel in the crown of facilities in the DOE landscape. So we're very pleased to have Linda Horton with, with us today. Uh, she uh, uh, gave the signal this morning uh, she gave the signal this morning to uh, shut down operation of the APS that has been running for the last 28 years. And I'm sure looking forward to uh, reopening the facility in one year's time. So Linda, uh, we are very pleased to have you here and thank you so much for all the support for the facilities in general. Um, and please. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Paul. Let me see if I can uh, manage to share my screen and the appropriate sequence of events with uh, so everything winds up where it needs to go. So so thank you all. I really appreciate being here and I was uh, very happy to kick off the uh, the uh, shutdown of the facility uh, to welcome the next era uh, with the uh, with new science, new capabilities, uh, stronger beams. It'll be great. So uh, just everyone has to be patient to get through the next year and the uh, and the team that's doing all the installation uh, is, has got a challenge ahead of them, but I know they're up to it. They've been, been working very hard. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bit of introduction to BES and, and sort of where we are budget-wise, which I know is something everyone is interested in. Uh, I think most people on this uh, call today on this, at this meeting know that, that BES supports basic science. Uh, but, but we also support world-class facilities, and we are engaged in making sure everyone in the country uh, that, that wants to have access uh, for our, to our facilities or to, for funding to do energy research is able to, uh, to uh, access that funding and the capabilities. So, so that's one of the uh, new emphasis areas that we're seeing in the program. Certainly, uh, APS and the CNM are uh, are leaders in this area 
of bringing in people from, from across the globe to work at their facilities. Uh, so this is the division that, that runs the facilities uh, for basic energy sciences. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, program managers for the X-ray neutron and nanoscale science research centers, a accelerator division, construction people, Hannibal uh, Joma is there uh, looking at the uh, readiness for the, uh, for the shutdown and, and seeing how that's going. Uh, and of course, uh, Ed Stevens is the uh, lead for the uh, from the BES programmatic perspective for the APSU. It takes takes a community to make one of these upgrades uh, work, and and Ed is is an important part of that team, along with the colleagues from Argonne and the uh, site office there at Argonne. So we have uh, new people. Uh, Dava Kivni uh, is, is new to our program. Uh, she, the, when I gave this presentation the last time, she was not part of the team. So uh, welcome to Dava, uh, who is the program manager for X-ray light sources and neutron facilities in our division. Uh, Dava is probably well known to y'all because she was a beamline scientist there at the APS earlier in her career. Uh, but has a wealth of other experiences with the uh, federal government that she is bringing to our team. Uh, from Brookhaven National Laboratory, uh, we were able to uh, bring on board Misha Zunenkov as the program manager for neutron scattering as well as X-ray light sources. It's a, it's a team. And again, Dava uh, Misha brings a wealth of experience in both neutron and X-ray scattering uh, to the uh, to the program management team, uh, with an emphasis in uh, soft matter uh, and a number of other areas that uh, the for which he is an expert. Again, was a beamline scientist for many years. So, uh, so we are ensure that we have those perspectives as we're managing these facilities. Since I know for the user community, the uh, first line of interaction is with the beamline scientists, a very critical uh, role for our facilities. Uh, we have a lot of upgrades in addition to the ones at the uh, advanced photon source. Uh, we have upgrades uh, going across the uh, across all of our facilities, uh, with the upgrade to the advanced light source, upgrades to beam lines at the NSLS two, and uh, two upgrades underway at the uh, at the uh, Linac coherent light source in California, plus a cryomodular repair facility. Uh, when we do our budgets in BES, we have to balance the research that we support, the operations of the facilities, as well as maintaining them in, uh, in effective uh, and robust operational state and maintaining upgrades for world-class capabilities. Uh, to that end, at the nanoscience centers, including the CNM, we have a recapitalization project that, that is underway right now as well. Uh, one of the things that we have found is that in, uh, in order to uh, support the, uh, the funding that's required for these facilities, it is really good to communicate the impact that y'all are making in your research. Uh, so uh, under DAVA's leadership, uh, we have launched a BES uh, user facility uh, webinar series. Uh, the first one was held in late January. Uh, to highlight the scientific impact that users and the facilities are making in areas that are priorities for the country. Uh, so clean energy, microelectronics, advanced manufacturing, and of course, biopreparedness. As we look to the future, uh, well, first let me, one, one more reflection in the past. Uh, we did do a presentation uh, a facilities webinar on QI, World QIS Day uh, that was held on April 14th, again, highlighting for BES research at the Nanoscale Science Research Centers and at the uh, light sources that impact quantum information science. Upcoming uh, facility webinars, the next up will be a uh, entire webinar dedicated to looking at impact in microelectronics. 
uh, followed by one or two, perhaps, webinars focusing on clean energy because of the breadth of those topics, biopreparedness, and then advanced manufacturing. Again, highlighting all the in-situ and operando uh, tools that we have at the light neutron sources in particular for advanced manufacturing, uh, but the, uh, the capabilities of the nanoscience centers proved to be really critical as we were in the pandemic and worrying about manufacturing capabilities for, uh, for uh, bio equipment uh, for, uh, for various uh, items that were needed as part of the pandemic treatment, including uh, making the very small things that deliver uh, drugs within our bodies, the, uh, the nano encapsulation of, of uh, treatments. So, so again, uh, it will be an exciting series of webinars. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, the audience we're hoping to attract are not just users who might not yet be using or are using our capabilities, but also congressional staff and uh, other people that are part of the stakeholders uh, for these very valuable resources. Uh, as we look at 23, 23 has a very good year from a budget perspective. All of the uh, user facilities are funded at 100% of their re-baseline budget levels. It, that's just a huge accomplishment. Uh, research uh, also had an increase uh, for the various uh, priority areas. Uh, again, uh, repeating some of the same themes that we saw in the previous slides manufacturing, advanced computing, quantum information science, um, the energy earth shots, and I'll say a little bit more about those, as well as our outreach programs uh, that are reaching out to underrepresented communities in our research and user facility portfolio. AIML, as Paul mentioned, is really important to our user facilities. It's important across all of the uh, research that we do. Uh, taking data and extracting the uh, extracting from that data uh, the science impact or extracting from operations data how we can more effectively operate our user facilities or your experiments. So uh, so we're working very hard in funding research in those areas. Um, one of the uh, topics that uh, a year ago was, was very critical to us was understanding how uh, operations funding requirements had changed at our user facilities. Uh, the uh, last rebaselining of the, uh, of the funding was some time ago. And with the pandemic and the changes in our operation, and then uh, inflation and supply chain issues, uh, it was clear we needed to really carefully look at the uh, funding requirements. Uh, so we have rebaselined the operations funding across the Office, office of Science. Uh, this included uh, making sure that the staffing was present for hybrid, in-person, and, and remote operations moving forward, uh, making sure that we were able to support required maintenance activities for robust operation of the accelerator as well as the uh, as well as the end stations and all of the equipment that's required to operate these complex facilities, uh, and then of course as we bring up these upgrades on online and add uh, beam lines and so on, uh, we have to have the staff that's required for those capabilities to operate optimally for the user community. Uh, this had oversight from across the office of science. Uh, and has become an ongoing assessment activity for us. Uh, one of the uh, things that we are continuing support for at the, uh, at the uh, user facilities as part of our operations funding is making sure we have the best capabilities in case we are faced with another pandemic, uh, as well as, as I've mentioned, the AI and L data uh, resources that are needed for operations. Uh, so, sorry, uh, as we look towards our research portfolio, uh, this list is here mainly for reference because for FY 2023, most of our topical or our special funding opportunities are already uh, well underway. Uh, so so it's, it's uh, quite literally too late to apply for some of them. 
However, there is an open annual solicitation that accepts applications continuously through the fiscal year uh, that is open right now uh, for uh, people who might have research ideas. Uh, as you're at these user meetings, I know it's a opportunity to learn what's going on and be inspired to go in new directions. So, so that might be something that you would be, uh, be interested in. Uh, we did have two uh, user facility specific funding opportunity announcements this year, uh, one on biopreparedness research. Uh, this is looking at uh, for BES, material science for bioprotection and sensing, building on capabilities at, at, at uh, all of the user facilities, uh, but uh, then also critically advanced user facility instrumentation. Uh, open right now uh, is, for national labs is a uh, call for proposals for uh, advanced scientific computing research for DOE user facilities. This is to build the advanced algorithms and software stacks that are needed for emerging techniques at the uh, light and neutron sources in particular. So uh, this is supported by uh, two offices in the Office of Science, Advanced Scientific Computing Research, as well as basic energy sciences. Uh, I should point out that the biopreparedness initiative uh, referred to as BRAVE uh, is again across the same offices, um, the computing office, BES, as well as biological and environmental research since so many of the, uh, of the needs associated with the pandemic included some of their capabilities. Uh, a new activity at the department over the last couple of years are the energy air shots. Right now, there are six of them. Uh, these uh, go across the department, so uh, funding from the uh, technology offices as well as the science side for the science foundations. Uh, the topics that have been announced to date for energy air shots are the hydrogen shot, long duration storage shot, which is focused on batteries for the grid uh, or energy storage for the grid, uh, carbon negative shot, removal of carbon dioxide from the environment, uh, the enhanced geothermal shot focused on geothermal energy, floating offshore wind, and industrial heat, which is focused on uh, eliminating some of the dependence on fossil fuels for the uh, heating requirements that are re uh, found in manufacturing. Uh, so the Office of Science in FY 2023 has launched two new branches of activities associated with the Energy Earthshots program. Uh, we have a new modality, uh, the Energy Earthshot Research Centers, uh, for which the funding opportunity announcement was released uh, for teams led by national labs, but going across the full breadth of the uh, research community universities, industries, private uh, sector uh, activities uh, to advance the foundational knowledge and enable capabilities that would address the challenges associated with the, with the cost and energy efficiencies and uh, enhanced capabilities required to meet these Earthshot goals, uh, which are all over the course of the next decade. I closely, uh, in addition to the energy or shot research centers. Uh, we also recognize the importance of the foundational research that's, that uh, includes teams led by ac academia. Uh, so we also have a new funding opportunity announcement uh, for which the pre-applications are due uh, later this month uh, for uh, the academic uh, community to be full participants in the uh, providing foundational research that will enable uh, meeting of the goals. Uh, what we recognized as well as the importance of academic research is that some of these have very cross-cutting, some of these earth shots have cross-cutting challenges. Uh, the example I like to use is membranes. Membranes appear in many, many, many different energy technologies. Uh, so that would be an example of a cross-cutting area for which better understanding of how to design and build and uh, enable uh, the characteristics required for membranes for specific purposes would really advance progress uh, 
that's one example. There are many examples that are discussed in the uh, in the funding opportunity announcement, and I'm sure uh, with your scientific imagination, you can augment that list uh, yourself. So, uh, so again, a important area for research uh, in basic energy sciences. Uh, for all of these, we expect the user facilities will play a profound role because uh, they have been so critical for making advances in, uh, in energy technologies. As we look towards FY 2024, uh, the uh, request is up again. Uh, it's at uh, nearly $2.7 billion for BES. Again, uh, there is, are some increases in the research programs, uh, looking at expansion of our outreach to minority serving institutions, uh, funding internships that would be at, many, in many cases, at the national laboratories, at the user facilities, so students can have hands-on experiences uh, in research related to, to, the, uh, to our entire uh, portfolio. A new area is the establishment of microelectronic science research centers uh, that were highlighted in the CHIPS and Science Act that you may have read about in the news. Uh, that for the Office of Science was largely a authorization meaning it was a, uh, a, the potential to, to have investment in this area. So uh, we are asking for an appropriation to actually receive monies to enable uh, these microelectronic science research centers in FY 2024. Uh, the user facility operations budgets have gone up substantially. However, with all the increasing costs that I've mentioned, uh, the actual request would only support these at about 90% of what the facilities have projected as a re baseline requirements for normal operations. So what this recognizes is if the uh, request is realized, the user facilities would balance user um, research support with uh, maintenance and other facility activities in a way that delivers the best opportunities for you as users, uh, maintain staff at a reasonable level uh, so we don't exhaust them all, and also uh, maintains a robust and safely oper operating facility. Uh, as we look at the 24 request, uh, there is no funding for the APS upgrade because it will have been fully funded uh, this year. It will need no additional monies. Uh, but we will be continuing to support the uh, the Nano Science Center recapitalization uh, project for its last year of funding in FY 2024. I am coming up on the uh, near the end as I, the time is passing. Uh, I put in two additional slides to talk about the uh, the microelectronic science research centers since these are brand new. I think that I have uh, have said most of what is on this slide. Uh, but I will add that this complements our base funding. We have uh, microelectronics research uh, throughout the portfolio uh, for single investigators and small groups, as well as some energy frontier research centers uh, that work in this area. But these would be uh, centers uh, explicitly focused on microelectronics uh, that would go across all the disciplines in the Office of Science and would be at a more robust funding level. Uh, the uh, areas uh, that have been identified, again, as a preliminary list uh, for areas that these centers might focus on are listed here. Uh, many of these are relevant to BES. Many of them will require engagement of the user facilities, again, to realize these, uh, these challenging goals for the next generation of microelectronics and all of them will take advantage of the fabrication facilities that are present in our nanoscale science research centers. So very exciting uh, initiative for, for BES. Uh, as a final reminder, uh, we have a lot of resources online, uh, including our basic research needs for next generation electronics uh, and other uh, reports that, that might help people in establishing what their priority research uh, areas for their own research may be based on what the community 
has told us are the uh, are the highest priority uh, directions and opportunities in various fields. So uh, with that, I will summarize with a look ahead. So as we look down the road, as you know, we've just started the dark time for the uh, construction of the upgraded ring at the APS, a very exciting time for the synchrotrons in general. Uh, in parallel, we are completing the upgrades for the uh, LINAC, the FEL, uh, based uh, X-ray source at Slack National Laboratory. It is coming to, to an end very quickly. Of course, we will be posting awards uh, as they become available. We will continue to look at budgets for the facilities to ensure the, that the operations funding uh, can accommodate supply chain and other uh, pressures that are on these budgets uh, while maintaining the staffing and maintenance that y'all need to have an effective research program. Uh, and finally, uh, Laurent is, has agreed to chair for us a workshop on basic research needs for accelerator-based instrumentation. This is going to look at the frontiers of the instrumentation for the large-scale X-ray and neutron scattering user facilities, especially the accelerators. Uh, focusing on the needs and opportunities uh, for research on future system components. So if you have ideas, talk to Laurent. Uh, and with that, I will close. And thank you again. I'm very excited to, uh, to not quite be there. I will be arriving uh, at Argonne uh, in person later today. Uh, the weather uh, up your way did not cooperate with flights yesterday. Uh, but I am really looking forward to, to being there uh, later today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, that was a great presentation. And thank you again from, from all of us for the support that you provide to our user facilities. We really appreciate it. Okay, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today. And this is uh, Dr. Thomas Fitzgibbons. He is a senior R&D leader at the Dow Chemical Company, where he has been working for about nine years. In this role, he is leading the surface and interface characterization teams in Texas and Pennsylvania for analytical science and corporate R&D. He received his bachelor's in chemistry and legal studies at the University of Buffalo in 2009 and his PhD in chemistry from Penn State University in 2014. Dr. Fitzgibbon's team is interested in understanding the structure of materials in order to accelerate the development of products with improved performance, and we look forward to hearing more about that today. Dr. Fitzgibbons. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So let me share my screen here. All right. Well, I wanted to begin by uh, thanking you for uh, having me this morning to talk to the APS user community as well as the CNM user community. I, uh, I've been a I've been a pretty regular user of both APS and CNM for probably about the last a little over a decade now. Um, I think I made my first beamline trip in 2011 when I was at Penn State. Um, doing work at HP Cat, so. <clears throat> um, but as 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 I was told, I'm a senior R and D leader um, at Dow Chemical, and today I wanted to uh, talk through a little bit about the things that I'm interested in as a researcher in um, analytical sciences here. Uh, it's part of corporate R&D, which means we are leveraged across the entire Dow portfolio. So we're looking at everything from polyurethanes to polyethylene to small molecule catalysis, all the way out through uh, formulated products like soaps and shampoos and um, even things like motor oils and things of that nature. So we get a chance to see everything. And one of the things that I'm always been really interested in is elucidating the structure of these sorts of materials. So one of the things I want to do is talk through a little bit of what I'll call the structure of everyday life. And what I'm going to start with is a little um, slide about one of my uh, 
one of my uh, <clears throat> favorite interviews that I've seen with Richard Feynman, uh, the late Richard Feynman. He gave an interview where he talked about a friend of his who was an artist um, telling him that as a scientist, Professor Feynman couldn't appreciate the beauty of a flower. And Professor Feynman always said to him that he thought that was a little odd that, you know, that he was sure that an artist could probably enjoy the aesthetics of a flower in more detail than him. But he was confused because the artist told him that the reason that a scientist couldn't appreciate the beauty of a flower was because they took it all apart. And when they took it all apart, it made it dull and boring. And one of the things that really I really appreciated when I would read about Professor Feynman is he would talk about the beauty at different length scales. Um, and that's kind of what I think about in, in when we think about the beauty of a flower, that it's not just seeing the bright color and the sunflower, but as scientists, we can think beyond just the macroscopic scale. We can think about the structure that exists in many dimensions. We can think about the petals and what gives them color. We can think about the reproductive parts of the flower and the different pieces and how it works together and why. And we can start asking the question of why does it work that way? Why does a flower have such vibrant colors? Why does do the reproductive parts of the flower stick up the way they do? And it goes down to its function. Every part, every structure that exists in that world exists because of a function to increase pollination. And that allows us as scientists to ask more questions about that structure function relationship. It allows us to understand things like pollinators. The reason you have these vibrant colors, it gives you the insight that these pollinators like bees and butterflies, that they can see the colors and you can start to Rule, pull that information out together and be able to understand the structure and the function of the material. And that is why, and to me, that only, like Professor Feynman said, it only adds to the beauty. It doesn't take away. Now, I don't get to work with a lot of flowers at Dow Chemical, at the Dow Chemical Company, but I do work with a lot of different materials. And I like to approach my understanding of these materials in a similar function. I like to understand what is the underlying structure that gives the materials the properties that it has. And I believe that understanding how the material structure provides its function is the underlying goal of material science. <clears throat> and I think one of the advantages of the facility that I'm talking to you today, the combination of the Center for Nanoscale Materials and the Advanced Photon Source, is they're both primed to uh, tackle these material science problems at these multiple length scales simultaneously. <clears throat> I believe that structure and the structure of a material lies at the heart of the material science, that you're not going to generate disruptive material science solutions without understanding the structure. I had a professor at Penn State, Professor Harry Alcock, who taught my graduate, graduate level materials chemistry class. And in it, he said, the synthesis of new materials is largely meaningless unless the structure and properties of those materials are investigated. That only by understanding the relationship between structure and properties can new materials be designed in a rational way. And I can't believe that that is any more true than, than it is today, that when I think about how do we design a new material, if we want to bring a new product to market um, here at Dow, if we want to develop a new material for a catalyst or anything like that, first question we often ask are what are its properties? What are the properties that we want to achieve? Then we think about, well, what is the structure of that material. And then we have to make that connection. And this is where characterization and materials characterization really plays a key role in elucidating how does the structure that we're observing give rise to the properties? Because that allows us to ask the next question. If I want to enhance the properties 
of this material, how can I change the structure to do so? And then we think about how do I make the material? <clears throat> when I talk about structure, I'm talking about many different length scales. I'm talking about everything from the atomic length scale where we're doing things like single crystal and electron diffraction to colloidal length scale where we're using tools like small angle X-ray scattering and transmission and scanning electron microscopies to micron and millimeter length scales where we're using um, high resolution X-ray microtomography to even larger length scales where we're scaling, scanning entire battery packs for automobiles using X-ray microtomography, using X-ray tomography. Um, so the length, so structure can exist and the properties of a final product are dictated by the structure that exists from the macro scale of things that you can see with your eyes all the way down to their atomic conformations. So throughout my talk, I'm going to try and walk you through kind of a standard day. And what I hope to give you is a deeper appreciation of the materials that we interact with on a daily basis. I'm going to take you through kind of four steps. I'm going to start with understanding where we wake up on our beds, um, going into the shower and thinking about the shampoos that we're using in our bodies, on our bodies, talk about how our cars have changed over the years, and then finally coming back to our homes. What I hope you take away is the understanding and the deeper appreciation that we're surrounded and interact with materials every day. These materials have been designed and engineered in a way to provide a higher quality of life. And the way that we do that is through the control of their structure. So I'm going to start with talking about um, viscoelastic foam. So in other words, I'm going to talk about kind of a memory foam mattress. <clears throat> These memory foam mattresses have become a staple in many homes. Um, you know, these are the mattresses that if you press down on them and lift your hand up, it leaves kind of an imprint and then the compression set comes back and uh, it rises again slowly. Um, these mattresses are made from a polyurethane formulation and that formulation is optimized to control things like compression set, viscoelasticity and breathability. I'm going to show a few examples of how we control some of these things through formulation of polyurethanes and give you an idea of kind of what the analytical tools that we use to characterize these sorts of materials look like. So I'm going to start with understanding the compression of foams. So the polyurethane foams are made from a reaction of either a polyether or a polyester polyol, which means it's a multifunctional polyol with multiple hydroxyl groups on the outside, multiple hydroxyl end groups, and that reacts typically with a multifunctional isocyanate um, group, and it forms a uh, thermoset material, meaning that it's, fully, it's a fully cross-linked network. When these reactions happen, the polyethers and polyesters they're typically pretty soft. You can also add things that are called chain extenders, which, which will make those domains even longer. Um, and those are relatively soft, so to speak. However, when the isocyanate reacts with either the hydroxyl group of the polyol or water that is often in the formulation, it'll form polyurea and urethane linkages. And those often have a much higher mechanical strength the, 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 those, those what are called hard domains are not miscible with the poly, with the, with the polyether, poly, poly, um, ester, uh, polyol domains. So you end up with a microphase separation and controlling this microphase separation can control things like how fast your foam cures. It can control things like how hard the final foam is. Um, and things of that nature. And we can use different catalysts, which is shown here, which is shown here on the, um, <laughs> on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. Uh, we have uh, two atomic force micro micrographs, as well as a small angle X-ray scattering pattern. These are two common ways for us to characterize the microphase separation present in a polyurethane 
uh, foam. What I'm showing here in the AFM is you can see on the top image, you have um, more of these bright spots, which are the hard domains and the dark spots are the soft domains. There's a few more of them in the top image than on the, um, than on the bottom limit image. It may be a little hard to see that, that there's more, but the way we actually do know that there's more microphase separation is by the small angle X-ray scattering shown next to it, where you have a higher structure factor scattering from the, hard, from the distances between hard domains in the material um, that's, uh, that's being analyzed. So like I said, the amount of microphase separation as well as the average distance of microphase separation um, can, give, can, can change things like the compressive strength of your, of your foam and therefore the, the, how hard or soft your mattress is. Additionally, when we think about the viscoelastic effect, the way that we typically generate something that is more viscoelastic or have more of that memory foam feel um, is by making it softer. There's typically a linear co correlation between softness and viscoelastic effect in the polyurethane system. Now, you can think if you want a memory foam mattress or a mattress that has that nice kind of viscoelastic effect, but you, for instance, like a firmer mattress, you could see where there's a difficulty there, where in order to get that viscoelastic effect, you need to have a softer polymer, but you want that firm mattress. So what can you do is we often add a composite material. We often make a composite material where we throw polymer particles into the polyurethane formulation such that it acts as a composite reinforcement and gives rise to a harder mattress while maintaining the viscoelasticity of the polyurethane matrix. We can use things like scanning electron microscopy to look at a mattress that uh, look at a foam that has no filler particles on the left to a foam that has a number of filler particles on the right. We can also use heavy metal staining in the electron microscope using things like ruthenium tetroxide to really bring out the contrast in those, in those particle-filled systems. We can see these filler particles that are preferentially segregated into these polyol-rich domains um, within the polyurethane foam, giving rise to the increased mechanical strength or the increased compressive strength of the foam mattress without sacrificing the viscoelasticity. So what I hope to have shown is that through control of the polymer chemistry and the compatibility of fillers, we can control the mechanical properties associated with foam bedding. Now, if you remember back to when foam mattresses first started gaining popularity, there was one major complaint that many, many consumers were made, had about these foam mattresses. They would, say to, they would say to brand owners that the foam was extremely comfortable. However, when they woke up, they were covered in sweat, um, that the mattresses were extremely hot and they held in moisture. And what you could see, what I'm showing here are two X-ray microtomography scans of polyurethane foams. The one on the left is a traditional polyurethane formulation, and the one on the right is a formulation that has been altered using new chemistries related to surfactant technology. And one thing that you can tell that's different about these two materials is the one on the left has a lot more what we call cell walls. And what that is, is when the foaming process is happening, you actually have closure between adjacent cells in the foam. What that does is it prevents the flow of air. It prevents the flow of moisture um, through the mattress while you're sleeping. And as a result, it gives you a very hot sleep. At Dow, we've developed a number of surfactant packages that can go into the polyurethane formulation that promote this opening or what we call drainage of the cells and you end up with much more open cell walls with a similar density and therefore similar mechanical properties to the state to the to the starting material 
with similar reaction kinetics so that your customer or whoever is the brand owner of the foam mattress doesn't have to slow down their manufacturing line waiting for those cells to open and pop. So we're able to use chemistry and our formulations expertise to understand how to change the structure from a closed cell to an open cell system to a mostly uh, a constricted cell to an open cell system. And we use things like x-ray microtomography to understand the changes uh, in the morphology present in these materials. So we've now woken up in our foam mattress and I, I hope most people, their next thing to do is to hop in the shower. Um, when you hop in the shower, uh, we're using a lot of very formulated products in our to clean our bodies, clean our hairs. And I want to talk a couple minutes about shampoo. Shampoo is a highly formulated product with a number of surfactants, deposition aids, rheology modifiers, things of that nature present in the material. All of them are in there for a specific reason. And it's really to satisfy these four components of, that are necessary for a successful shampoo or, or, a, or a useful shampoo. Each of these performance requirements are governed by the structure that is present within the formulation. The first and probably most important is the cleaning performance. If you think about, well, how does a soap clean? You can look at the top right there where I have some cartoon drawing of some micelles. Um, most of the material in this, a lot of the material inside of this shampoo are my, are uh, surfactant systems. So these are amphiphilic systems that are have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head group. Um, if you put them on a greasy surface or oily surface, they will sol they can solubilize the oil inside of these droplets in these micro in these uh, in the form of like a micro emulsion, and then be washed away, giving you good cleaning performance. Additionally, these amphiphilic materials, they like to migrate to the surface. They have a component in them, that greasy hydrophobe, that doesn't like to be in the water. Um, so they can migrate to the surface, therefore lowering the interfacial tension and the energy barrier between oil and water. And what that does is that will allow that, that soap or that material to foam. You want to generate that thick, foamy lather while you're in the shower, that's a way to do it is by having these surfactant systems in there. The two systems, the two uh, parameters that I want to talk about a little more in detail are the rheology and feel of the shampoo, as well as the deposition behavior of a shampoo conditioner, where you're actually depositing an oil from the shampoo onto your hair. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about both of these situations um, on the next few slides. So, the rheology of a shampoo formulation is really important in the fact that you want to have a specific feel of the shampoo. You don't want to tip your bottle over and have this really watery solution run out onto your hand. You also don't want to have to use a spoon to scoop out the shampoo and put it on your hair either. So you want it to be a gel-like material that you can squirt out of a bottle and understanding how to build that rheology using the various components that make up a formulation is a really important situation. A lot of this rheology build happens through the complex phase behavior of surfactants. So surfactants, like I said, are these amphiphilic molecules that have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head group. That hydrophilic head group can be, for instance, a sulfate anion, it can be a cationic quaternary amine. It can be a polyethylene glycol um, oligomer um, covalently attached to this long chain hydrophobe, oftentimes a hydrocarbon, a C8 to C16 hydrocarbon. These materials often have a complex phase behavior. And what I mean by that is when you put them into water at relatively low concentrations, they're going to self-assemble into micelles. When we look at a binary surfactant phase diagram with water and an alcohol ethoxylate surfactant shown here on the bottom left, 
This was measured using um, an optical mic optical microscopy, so using polarized light optical microscopy. Um, we can we can see that from about zero to about 45 weight percent, it remains optically transparent, no birefringent effects, and what we assume is that that is a micell micell rich phase. Above 45 weight percent, it forms this hexagonally closed this hexagonal liquid crystal phase, and then it goes through another phase, and then it forms an alpha lamellar phase. What these are, these are actually the surfactants reaching a specific concentration in which they undergo further self-assembly from distinct micelles into long-range um, lyotropic liquid crystals. Now, when you get even above 75 weight percent, you go back into a non-birefringent a non phase. And what that is is actually an inverse micelle phase where you have... Um, surfactant my, where you have surfactant micelles where now the greasy hydrophobe is now the continuous phase and any water that is in the system is trapped in the hydrophilic core. However, we know that it's not as simple as this when you're in this dilute micelle regime. Not everything is this nice spherical micelle like I showed on the last slide. By changing the chemistry of the surfactant, you can see how the structure of the surfactant changes. What's shown here in the middle is, the com is a comparison between a primary and secondary alcohol with oxalate. So what you're doing here is you have a long-chain hydrocarbon covalently bound to a polyethylene glycol block, and you're changing where that bonding happens. In the primary alcohol with oxalate, the bonding happens through, an, through a through a um, ether bond on the end of the of the end of the hydrocarbon on the secondary alcohol of oxalate it's happening somewhere else along the hydrocarbon chain while the oxygen is in the secondary position and what you can see is in the primary alcohol phase you get a small angle scattering pattern that is con that is consistent with a spherical micelle however when you go into the secondary alcohol of oxalate phase the micelle actually changes shape slightly into an elliptical micelle. So by changing the chemistry of the surfactant, we can change the self-assembly structure present. Also, when you're in these dilute micelle regimes, which is often where you are when you're dealing with detergents, you're in the you know five to nine weight percent regime, um, you want to build viscosity. You can build viscosity by going into these liquid crystal regimes. However, there you're going to get into the situation where you're going to have to scoop your, scoop your, uh, scoop your uh, shampoo out of the bottle with a spoon. So what you want to do is we often change the morphology of the micelles using another variable, a variable like salt or electrolyte concentration. And what you can do by, by the addition of these electrolytes is you can change the local self-assembly of the surfactant and cause them to form elongated, what are called worm-like micelles. And what makes these worm-like micelles really interesting is not only that they're long rods, but they are actually of a length where you can actually get entanglement between the rods. And that entanglement between these micellar rods gives rise to an increase in viscosity. So what I'm showing here on the right is the formation of a worm-like micelle in the presence of a primary alcohol ethoxylate, where the blue curve shows a scattering pattern very consistent with a spherical micelle. The purple curve, as it's moving up, shows, a, um, shows um, actually a rod-like micelle. So it's not quite what I would consider a worm-like micelle because we still have the ability to measure the length of the rod using traditional small angle x-ray scattering. But as you get to a higher salt concentration, say in the magenta curve, you see not only the diameter of the rod, but then you see this longer range correlation and structure at low Q, indicating that you have transitioned from a rod, from a rod like my spherical micelle to a rod like micelle to a worm like micelle. Now you may say, well, if all I need to do is add salt, let me just add a bunch of salt and I can get there um, without any problem. However, many surfactants undergo what's called a salting out effect, 
where if you add too much salt, like as shown in the orange curve, you go from those worm-like micelles to actually a flocculation event where the micelles will actually come out of solution and become insoluble and actually flocculate out of the, out of the solution. So this is, these are different tricks we can play with understanding how to build rheology using the surfactant structure, whether it's the surfactant chemistry, whether it's additives, whether it's understanding the phase behavior, all of those play a key role in us building the surfactant rheology that's necessary in the uh, shampoo formulations. Another area that's of a lot of interest is the deposition behavior. When we talk about shampoo and conditioners, um, oftentimes we have some sort of a deposition polymer that is supposed to remain behind on your hair as a conditioner for the hair. Now, you want it to remain behind after washing. However, it needs to be in solution while it's on the shelf. You need to have it be shelf stable, but also have an ability for it to deposit. So, what you do in this sort of a formulation is in the concentrated shampoo, which is the shampoo that, that you have as the bottle, the polymer and micelles are solubilized in a complex. And what I mean by that is similar to what's shown on the bot center here in the bottom, where you have your deposition polymer that is surrounded by spherical micelles that keep it in solution during, during the sample, during, in its concentrated state. Now, you put that in your hair, you, you get it all foamed up and lathered up, you get under the water and you undergo a dilution event. When that dilution occurs, another polymer surfactant complex forms called a coacervate, where you get a liquid-liquid phase separation where the polymer becomes the dominant structure and the surfactant begins to be washed away. And this insoluble structure then deposits on your hair. We can use small, small angle X-ray scattering to identify the onset of coacervation in these material in, in this sorts of systems where we look at a standard surfactant composition of you know a, a, a sulfate and a cap b type surfactant with the deposition polymer and in the blue curve that's the concentrated material you see the scattering from the surfactant complex surfactant micelles and then you see some scattering at a relatively low power law at low q indicating the um presence of a long range structure like is shown in the center bottom there. However, upon dilution, we see a rapid increase on in term, we see a rapid increase in the low Q region in the slope of the low Q region. That rapid increase in slope at the low Q region upon dilution is indication of a flocculation event where we're actually getting coacervate formation. Um, where we're getting coacervate formation and deposition behavior. You can see here that we studied three different deposition polymers. Two of the deposition polymers showed pretty standard coacervation behavior where in the concentrated shampoo, we had a reasonably low power law exponent and then increasing, increasing dilution showed a drastic sharp uptake in um, the power law exponent indicating a coacervate formation. However, in the third polymer system, we didn't undergo a coacervation event. So this is a new chemistry that we were looking at, and we needed to understand how can we get this coacervation event to occur if we wanted it to occur, or and and where where was the re where were the regions of phase stability in this sort of a formulation. So what we were able to do was we were able to use our high throughput formulation capabilities here at Dow, combined with the um, high brilliance of the synchrotron beam, combined with machine learning algorithms from our collaborators at NIST to, to map um, the phase behavior of this surfactant polymer deposition map. And what we were able to do is map a number of different samples 
and then use a machine learning algorithm to generate such similarity matrices to allow us to segment them into different regions of interest. And then using a priori knowledge and form factor modeling, we were able to identify each of those phases where in this orange phase, you have the scattering patterns that can that are consistent with a cat B rich polymer complex. The blue phase, a less rich polymer complex, we're able to identify pure micelle phases where there's no polymer, deposition polymer present. We're able to show where there's only less and polymer complex forming. And then most importantly, we were able to show here in the green several areas where we could actually form a coacervate phase um, and therefore generate regions of deposition um, as we continue making newer formulations. So after we get out of the after we get out of the shower, we need to drive somewhere and go to work. Um, as I'm sure all of you know and have experienced, automobiles have changed dramatically over the past few years. I remember when I got my first car, um, I had a 93 Buick that was seemingly all metal everywhere. It was for when I crashed my car. When I crashed my car in the snow, my parents knew I would be safe and all of that good stuff. But, you know, nowadays where we're looking at new cars that enhance fuel economy and distance per charge as we move to electrification. And that has led us to use more and more plastic body parts to lightweight the vehicle. However, even though we're using these plastic light body parts to lightweight the vehicle, we need to maintain a high safety standard for these vehicles. One way that we do that is through the use of thermoplastic olefins with impact modified elastomers. These are polypropylene materials with an elastomeric uh, component placed in them to increase the, increase the toughness of the polymer. And the TPO gives you the ability for painting and satisfies the uh, looks that are needed for our auto, auto consumers. So one thing that we do that our team at Dow does to analyze um, these TPO-based materials is to understand the failure mechanism and the, the use of new additives into these materials to improve their properties. So to give you an idea, I wanted to show how we use small angle and wide angle X-ray scattering to understand deformation and failure in semicrystalline polymers. When we look at an as molded or a compression molded po polyethylene part, we get a nice um, symmetric wide angle X-ray scattering and small angle X-ray scattering pattern. They're very isotropic. If you integrate the intensity across a function of azimuthal angle, you'll get very flat lines. However, if you take that material and place it in an instron and start to pull it apart and stretch it, what you start to see is in the wide angle X-ray scattering, you start getting more, orient, more preferred orientation along that axis by seeing the intensity of the uh, X-ray beam, the intensity of your X-ray scattering increase preferentially um, in one direction and decrease in the other. You also see in the small angle scattering evidence of lamellar rotation where you guys start to see orientation and changes in intensity as a function of azimuthal angle um, as you integrate around the scattering curve, uh, scattering uh, pattern um, corresponding to the lamellar rotation, dis lamellar uh, distance, interlamellar distance. Now, as you continue to stress this, strain this material and pull it to the point of failure, you start to see some really interesting features in your wide angle and small angle scattering. In the wide angle scattering, your intensity only exists in one direction. You get something that looks very much like fiber-like scattering because you are actually going through crystalline fibrillation. Secondly, in the small angle scattering, you not only get further anisotropy due to the lamellar rotation, but you actually get a sharp increase in the, um, in the intensity of the small angle X-ray scattering. That sharp increase in intensity is due to the actual formation of micro voids and crazing artifacts as the material is being ripped apart. You get small pinhole voids. So now that you, now your scattering signal and the small angle 
is much more intense in those um, final final few seconds before before total failure. So we know how a polymer deforms, a semicrystalline polymer deforms. So what do we do to increase the toughness? Well, we add that rubber modified material, but we don't just add the rubber modified material. The rubber modified material, the elastomer, doesn't necessarily interact well with the polypropylene matrix. So oftentimes we need to add some sort of compatibilizer, this sort of a block copolymer type material that will compatibilize the polyethylene based rubber material with the polypropylene based matrix material. And that has a, dra that has a big effect on what we observe in the wide angle and small angle X-ray scattering data. If we look here at the very top, this is an, is an unmodified, no, no compatibilizer, polyethylene, polypropylene blend. And you see this, that similar um, lamellar rotation followed by fibrillation, followed by microvoiding event. However, when you add a compatibilizer to the, to the material, you see a delay, a, a distinct delay in the lamellar rotation um, and their and microvoiding events in the material you see a much you see a distinct delay in the lamellar rotation so it becomes much less of a fibrillar fib, fibular scattering pattern at higher strain rates higher strains um, when you have this compatibilizer in there and a similar thing is observed in the small angle x-ray scattering as you go from a very isotropic material to anisotropic to the um, to the uh, fibrillation and um, fibrillation and microvoiding, that really when you add this block copolymer compatibilizer, it delays these failure mechanisms in the material, and what that does in turn is increases the toughness. So you may ask, well, why does it work? And we can analyze this using transmission electron microscopy. The reason that these materials work is because the block copolymer works in a way that ensures the adhesion between the matrix and rubber domains. What's shown on the right are two transmission electron micrographs of these uh, TPO materials where you have the polypropylene matrix, which is the bright white material, and the, poly, the polyethylene rubber core polyethylene rubber, which is the darker material. And you can see in these darker domains, there are, pure, there are domains of polypropylene, the bright, brighter domains in those darker domains. This is with the um, polymer modified, the block copolymer compatibilizer that is in there. We can, the reason you have this contrast is again, because of the heavy metal staining that is done. If you expose a TPO-like material to ruthenium tetroxide, the polyethylene domains will take up a lot of the ruthenium and allow you to have a lot of contrast in transmission electron microscopy. But if we look at the high resolution image and look at these domains where you have polypropylene and the polyethylene together, you can start to see what look like little spaghetti strands. What these are are actually lamellae from the polyethylene and polypropylene crisscrossing the interface. You can see it here between the matrix and the rubber, and then you can see it as well in these small polypropylene domains in the polyethylene rubber as well with more detail. These lamellae that overcross the interface really work to tie those two incompatible materials together, increasing the toughness and therefore the property, the mechanical properties related to the uh, to the, poly, to the uh, resulting TPO material. So that's, that's a way that we often work to lightweight our cars by sw swapping out metal materials for plastic materials while not sacrificing safety by, by keeping a highly tough material that we can keep on the outside of our vehicles. So when you come home at the end of the day, you often hope that your, your, your house is at the same temperature you left it. You also hope that there's not water seeping in from your foundation. Um, these all exist. These are all possible because material science challenges have been addressed. Things around thermal insulation. 
the house is a great way, great place to look for where we have advanced materials residing. If you look at the thermal insulation on the outside of your house, it's often either a polystyrene or a uh, polyurethane or polyisocyanurate foam panel. The reason foams, foam panels are used as thermal insulation is because they affect the thermal conductivity in three ways. First, the cellular nature of the material provides a low density and that low density reduces the thermal conduction of the solid material between as, as the heat wave propagates. Secondly, there's often a chemical blowing agent that is used that resides inside the cells of the foam, which have a, has a lower thermal conductivity than air, and therefore reduces the thermal conductivity of the panel further. Third, and the way that we at Dow really try to impact the thermal insulation market is through the control of the cellular structure. A third way that heat propagates from one side of a material to the other is the radiative heat transfer. So if you think about heat as an infrared wave, you want it as it propagates from one side of the material to the other to interact with and scatter from as many points between as many points as possible between the two between the start and end point. The way to do that is to decrease the cell size of the resulting foam. Understanding the cell size and the formulation variables that have an effect on cell size is a major research thrust in the thermal insulation market. One thing that we use at Dow to understand the cellular nature of the foams is X-ray microtomography. We do this both at, both at Argonne National Lab and in-house with our tools. And we really use it as a way to quantitatively understand not just the size of the cells, but the orientation that they have relative to the manufacturing process so that we can understand what variables that we can, can we play with around surfactant structure, chemical structure, processing, processing, processing parameters that can allow us to minimize the cell, the cell size in these, rigid, in these rigid foam materials. Another area is around the, is the, around the high density polyethylene that is used as a moisture barrier in a lot of agricultural or um, foundation type applications around houses. Um, polyethylene is a very good moisture, is a pretty good moisture barrier. Um, the way moisture propagates through a polyethylene film is it follows a tortuous pathway trying to avoid the individual lamellar crystals and work its way through the material. So one thing that you can think to try and do to increase the moisture, moisture barrier is to get all of your lamellar crystals to lay in the same direction, forming a plate-like geometry in the, in the parallel to the direction, parallel to the, um, um, axis of a parallel to the axis that the moisture is coming through. What we've done is th is we've developed a method to use small angle X-ray scattering and looking at polyethylene films to understand how to quantitate the amount of lamellae that are randomly oriented or or edge on lamellae versus the number that are flat on lamellae. Um, looking at the small angle X-ray scattering and various orientations of these polyethylene films. We do this as a way to understand the effect of polymer resin design. So things like molecular weight distribution, um, poly uh, molecular weight distribution, co-monomer contents, things of that nature, as well as the effect of polymer processing. So film line speed, extrusion, preferential orientation that is formed um, post-processing through, through uh, pulled methods, things of that nature. So finding out ways that we can increase that moisture, moisture barrier um, are things that are really important to us. So what I hope I was able to share with you this morning 
was that structure, the structure that are, structure exists around us at many levels. And the structure of materials and the structure of our world, they control the performance of, of the things that are around us every day. You know, one thing that I enjoy, as I said at the beginning, I, I, find, I find that being able to take these things apart, being able to think about what is the underlying structure that gives rise to a property has its own beauty. And that's what really keeps me going as a scientist. It is really trying to be able to explain why we're observing specific um, specific uh, properties based on the, based on a material structure. And what I really want to drive home is that as we continue to progress, um, as we look at the adoption of new chemistries, as we look for more sustainable new chemistries to lower our carbon footprint as we look for more sustainable solutions through things like lightweighting our cars, through making biodegradable surfactants, making um, um, cer- enhancing a circular economy. We need to understand what the structure is in the materials that do work so that we can ensure that when we design these new materials and these new chemistries that we can achieve either similar performance or better performance so that we can optimize the use of these new chemistries and sustainable solutions. Again, I think, as I mentioned before, I think there's a true power in the partnership that exists between the Center for Nanoscale Materials and the APS. I think having this ability to characterize materials at multiple length scales and as these two facilities are working hand in hand on being able to develop and deploy um, solutions that allow us to get closer and closer to inoper- true inoperando conditions. These are only going to accelerate the materials development and discovery that's available um, in all disciplines. And I wanted to, of course, thank my co-authors, my colleagues at Dow, um, specifically Michelle Mejia, Shoren Gu, John Riley, Pre- and Pre- Preston McDaniel, Dan Yi. Wang Lin Yu, Dan Miller, Karu Au, and Jeff Monroe. A lot of the work that was shown today was work that um, that they were able to do. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a senior R&D leader now. Uh, many of these folks um, are, are very strong in the lab still. Myself, I, I haven't been in the lab in a little while, but I'm very happy um, to work with work with this group of people, not only in analytical science, but across across the Dow Chemical Company, and also um, we've done I've done a lot of work um, at general user facilities here at APS and elsewhere at my time in Dow. Um, so working with obviously our team at D&D Cat, Dennis Keen, Mike Geis, and Steve Wigand, as well as our uh, Richard Gilliland at Chess and then Tyler Martin and Peter Bacage at NIST. Um, they're really helping push push the technology of materials discovery forward with us. Um, and with that, um, I wanted to thank you again for listening at, for the, to to my talk this morning and inviting me to to, to meet with you. Thank you so much, Thomas, for that wonderful talk. Um, I will definitely be looking at my bed and my shampoos differently now. Um, So, okay, it's time now for a break, and we will come back at 11 a.m. to hear from Laurent, the APS director. See you then. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Sorry, struggling to find the unmute button here. Well, thanks a lot. It's it's my pleasure to to be here in this uh, uh, virtual setup to give you a, an update on the APS. It's uh, certainly a very special day today, um, given that you know after um, 28 years of operation, the APS has shut down. I think it's fair to say everyone has been used to uh, you know the staff or user community has been used to this rhythm of running for three months and being shut down for a month for maintenance. 
and suddenly all of this come, uh, comes to a stop. So that's uh, uh, kind of a weird feeling. You know, about 100 days ago, we uh, uh, decided to put the countdown on the, on the website uh, after having navigated this uh, a difficult period with supply chains and, and potential uh, uh, you know, um, uh, problems for the project, we finally got there. And so it was a weird feeling on Sunday morning when I wake up to, uh, to see the countdown you know, down to zero days. So uh, really a, a big milestone for everyone and uh, an exciting time for the, for the future of the APS and the user community. The first thing I'd like to say is you know, this time last year when I uh, talked at the uh, APS and user meeting, this was my first, um, my first meeting, I announced the appointment of Jim Kirby as the project director and Elmi People 7 as the project manager for APSU. And I really want to congratulate them, uh, first of all, and commend them for their efforts and, and their drive uh, to make this happen. And uh, you know, their entire team has been absolutely uh, you know, fantastic. We've delivered the long beam line building earlier this year. And I'm not gonna steal any of the thunder from Jim. He's gonna go through that this afternoon, but Certainly the LDB and some of the work that has been done on the module assembly has been absolutely superb. So uh, they deserve a lot of credit for what has been done in the last year with, with the entire team and also all of the APS staff um, that have continued, uh, you know, very good operation of the facility in the meantime. Uh, in terms of the facility itself, uh, you know, despite a lot of challenges with a facility that is uh, at this stage almost 30 years old, in terms of the RF system, the, some of the electronics we have, uh, and so on and so forth, we managed to uh, have a very good availability in, in fiscal 22. So it's, uh, it's at a level of 96.4% for the entire year. And the two runs that we had in uh, October, December, and the, the one uh, in, uh, since January have also had um, a good availability metric, even though you know, we, we want typically this number to be, be even higher. I think given some of the challenges that we face, um, you know, it's, it's been extremely good and a good delivery of beam for all of our user facility. Um, a lot of work has happened and you, you, know, you, you may have seen some of the challenges we faced recently. This is a, an interesting one where uh, I will put it this way. And I think we've been pretty lucky that uh, this didn't get, um, it put us in a more difficult position than what we've been. This is an undulated device, essentially crashing on the vacuum chamber, and this has been some kind of ghost motion, and uh, you know some pickup, uh, the, the, the ID control system picking up noise and actually moving in this extremely tapered position until uh, eventually the uh, the ID actually actually crashes. So uh, there's been some um, remedial action from from this. We know how to prevent that in the future, but. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, and it could have been much worse than that. We lost about a day of beam time, uh, but we we managed to recover from that and eventually finish the run with a pretty good access to beam. So that's one of the challenges that we you have seen, and you've been pretty much aware of that as it as it was happening. Some of the things you haven't necessarily seen is all of the maintenance that needs to happen in a in a facility of this size and and of this age. Uh, a lot of the cables, for example, you can see on the right hand side here, the, the, the complex topology of high uh, voltage cables that are running underground under the facility. Uh, some of these cables are uh, actually uh, pretty old and need uh, constant maintenance. So this is a large power shutdown that we uh, exercise in the, in the winter, just after the, win the winter break. And you can see um, um, uh, some of these completely new cables that have been put in. Uh, you see this, uh, this is some of the cables before the repairs, some of the new cables after the repairs. And all of this work is not necessarily seen by the, 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 the users, so to speak, but there's certainly a huge amount of work. So the uplift in the facility budget that Linda was talking about this morning, uh, the rebaseline uh, of the facility budget is certainly welcome uh, in terms of making sure that we, we have the number of people on the beam line to support complex operation. Uh, you know, more and more complex in situ or parental experiment, as well as, uh, you know, uh, access to uh, remote operation, but also in order to be able to do all of this maintenance uh, in a timely fashion and, and, and doing it preemptively. So we don't end up in position where some of these uh, uh, problems could appear in the future. Um, we're also thinking about a lot of work has been going on to improve the future operation of the facilities. So some of the 
you know, at the heart at the heart of the facility, we have some uh, technology that are now uh, pretty old, like you know, this Glystron, this tube technology that has been running essentially the power the RF system for the last uh, you know almost three decades. This technology is now switching, uh, is, is you know ready to be switched to solid state amplifier technology, and so the team here uh, from the accelerator system division has been working very hard to actually replace, you know, put a plan together to replace all of this tube technology by uh, solid state amplifiers. The first prototype was delivered this year, which shows, uh, uh, you know, an excellent stability. And so the facility should be able to operate at a very high reliability, uh, you know, a very high uh, availability time in the future. So that's, that's really, uh, really good to see. And we not only pushing the technology that it will enable the facility to, um, to work in a most efficient manner. We are also investing in technology that will make uh, you know, the future even brighter than what it is now. And the APSU is, is not, uh, you know, delivering the APSU is not the end of something, but the start of a, of a new adventure for the APS and for its user community. And investing in a technology that will continue to improve uh, the brightness of the beams, continue to deliver even more science in the future is absolutely essential. So I'm pr proud to report very recently the installation of a new uh, superconducting undulator. This is a niobium-13 conducting a superconducting undulator rather than a niobium-titanium um, system, and that will enable, in the fullness of time, to have um, a much to reach much higher magnetic field and decrease the, the the period even further for this undulator compared to where where we are now. And certainly, if we can combine that with you know, pushing the magnetic gaps in this device even further down, which is certainly looks possible uh, from the preliminary studies that we have done, we should be able to open the door for yet again another factor five in brightness in the future of the APS. So this investment and this research and R&D programs are absolutely important to uh, give us a look ahead and, and, and explore the possibilities for, for the future. One thing that, um, you are very much aware of is the, the data deluge that we will see as we turn up the facility again in 2024. Uh, currently, the facility is um, uh, essentially producing about, you know, a bit less than 10 petabytes of data per year. Uh, to put it in perspective, you know, the CERN facility, the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, is generating about 30 petabytes a year. This is, of course, after they've done all of the cleanup. So, you know, 10 petabyte is, is a relatively large number already. With APSU, the facility is going to produce about 200 petabyte of data every year as we start the new, uh, the new machine in uh, 2024. So for example, in 2025, the APS will collect as much data as we would have collected for all of the previous years since the inception of the APS. So one of the challenges translate this uh, you know, large data collection into uh, scientific discovery and we certainly want to accelerate the time to, to science, uh, you know, the time to production. And we want to give the user the, facility, the ability to be uh, uh, really inspecting the sample in, in real time. So there's been a lot of work. Um, Paul Kern this morning um, mentioned uh, the uh, upcoming Aurora system, which will be, you know, the final blades are being uh, delivered in the system as we speak. And certainly the combination and the very tight coupling between the APSU and Aurora will give us a competitive advantage when it comes to be able to explore, explore some of this uh, real-time science. So a recent example of you know, using uh, a, a very complex system of edge devices, HPC, uh, AI and ML training to be able to reconstruct a live tachographic data doing some of the training uh, essentially in real time using supercomputer. So this is very exciting. And certainly that's the future of what uh, fourth generation light sources would look like uh, without any doubt. And you can see, this is a complex ecosystem. We have to think about storage. We have to think about data transfer. We have to think about a hybrid uh, HPC, conventional supercomputer, AI machines, and put all of that together so that it, you know, we provide a, a seamless experience uh, to the user community. So a lot of work has been put in place in the last few years and certainly this year to be able to demonstrate that this technology is ready to be deployed at scale uh, and, and on this very large machine like Aurora. So it's very good to see the progress and uh, very exciting 
uh, phase of, of uh, computing science, uh, uh, helping the APS users. Um, we've done a lot of this work. Uh, you know, a lot of the work has been on extremely safety. Every year we publish our safety metrics. This is one of the core value of, of, of Argon, obviously. This is uh, the, the number one priority when it comes to a large project like APSU. We are really focusing heavily on that. Uh, on in fiscal 22, we had a, a good safety record. And of course, we're aiming to get even better in fiscal 23. We're always pushing this number as low as we can and making sure we do the right thing in terms of communication within the complex and helping people navigate this very complex phase of the project. This is by far the number one priority when it comes to uh, operating uh, a facility like the APS. Well, our, our user community, of course, is uh, probably approaching uh, this uh, shutdown period, this dark time with a little bit of uh, you know, some concern because they need to bring the research, uh, we need to continue with that research. So throughout the year, we've been um, uh, you know, giving opportunities to the uh, user community to navigate this complex space of light sources. Uh, you can find on this website at this address here, for example, a very large matrix that help you uh, uh, make a correspondence between the APS beamline that you're currently using and the one that are available at other facilities to help you uh, transition some of your research to the other US light sources. And also we've been working abroad uh, to give you opportunity to collect data at other sources. We have made a deal, uh, some kind of reciprocity agreement with the diamond light source to accommodate a relatively large number of macromolecular crystallography users uh, uh, research during the APS shutdown and six months after, uh, after the, this period to the diamond light source. And you know, uh, Diamond will have access to, to the APS when they shut down their facility for the upgrade, which is uh, currently planned for uh, 2029. So it's really an exciting time. We do everything we can to make sure you, you continue to have access to, to, to the best um, uh, capabilities in the complex and also abroad. So that's um, something we, we're quite proud of. As part of this APS CNM uh, user meeting, you are going to talk also on Thursday about uh, uh, you know, what we do in the you know, there's a session on DEI. Uh, and I think this year we're going to talk about reducing systemic biases through anonymized application process. So we have invited Lou Stolger, who has been um, leading the effort for double anonymous or uh, double blind reviews uh, for the telescope. And he will be joining us to uh, share his experience in this space. So we really want to continue to democratize access to this large cap facility for users. And this is one way that we can you know, share a good conversation and see, uh, maybe think a little bit outside the box of what we, we've been currently and what we've been doing historically in this space. And for our users, a lot of things will be changing. Uh, not having access to the APS certainly is one for a year, but as, you, as we come back on the other side, a lot of things will have changed also on the procedure for getting access to beam, fly, beam time. So we are revising our, our proposal system. As we know, we, we are launching a universal proposal system. This is a work in collaboration with Slack um, and, um, and, and Brookhaven to provide a common platform for the access to, for the request for beam time and also for the peer review process. We have new registration system at Argon that will be uh, uh, rolled out in the, in the coming months. And we have also a new research organization registry barriers that will be rolled out into the Argon Enterprise Registration System. So uh, things will not only change in terms of capabilities, in terms of brightness and new beamlines, but also in the way you access the facility. So please make sure that uh, you are aware of the system coming online later on, and we will certainly get your feedback and uh, and uh, get uh, you know hear from you in terms of how we can move this uh, system even. Uh, even um, to a better place in the future and uh, it, it continue to improve um, these, um, these systems. The science continues. Uh, I don't want to deep dive into this, but uh, some recent example of you know, XPCS looking at the dynamics uh, of defects in uh, oxide and strontium cobalt oxide here uh, using XPCS and non reversible process of going, from a, you know, going through a metal insulator transition up and down uh, as, you, as you change the temperature of this device. There's been a lot of work in structural biology as well. I mean, this one is pretty exciting. This is combining uh, you know, the power of uh, AI and ML uh, using some of these alpha fold uh, um, trained models that can essentially 
uh, resolve the protein folding problem when with a, a simple sequence of uh, amino acids. And so bringing this uh, computa computational uh, kind of chemistry with, uh, uh, with the experimental system here and you doing structural biology. The, the users continue, of course, to uh, produce a huge number of publication. We do see, uh, I have to say, the effect of the pandemic. You know that typically there is an 18 month um, delay between the time of an experiment and the uh, and, and publication coming out. So we, we do see in the number of publication in 2022, uh, uh, a decrease compared to the peak, which was about uh, 2020. But given the uh, impact of the pandemic and how, uh, you know, how unique this time was, I think it's uh, relatively good to see that we're still, you know, almost reaching 2000 publications per year in 2022. So that's really a, a testament to the, the, the staff that has worked extremely hard at the facilities to support the operation, uh, being able to innovate and, and uh, being able also to pivot the thinking and introduce new uh, remote access model that Linda mentioned this morning in her in a presentation. So, and also uh, a huge uh, credit to the user community that it continues to access the facility and make the best of the, of the science. We still have more than 40% of the publication published at the APS are in journals with an impact factor above seven, which is the metric we tend to use to compare to, to our synchrotron. And I have to say that it's really best in class when it, um, it comes not only to the number of papers, but also in terms of the, the quality of these papers. And so that's where we are after a very, very busy year. Uh, this is a picture I stole from Uta Ruet this morning, who was on the beam line. And uh, as we were shutting down the user program for, for the facility after nearly 28 years of, uh, of uh, research uh, enabled by, by the APS, um, they threw a little party on, on the sectors there. You can see the message. We will be back uh, in 2024 and one year from now. And really, as I said before, this uh, will mark uh, a new era for, for synchrotron research, certainly with the fourth generation source um, uh, being available in the US and, uh, and, and a, you know, a unique brightness uh, uh, in terms of hard X-ray science with a factor 500 increase in brightness. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you next year. Uh, we, uh, we certainly make sure that everything will go uh, to plan. And we will restart the facility, as you know, we started commissioning in January and we hope to have uh, about 25 milliamps of beam by April of 2024. So I leave you with this image and uh, I don't know if we take question or not, but happy to take question if you are in. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update, Laurent. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Um, so our last speaker for this morning session is going to be Ilke Arslan, who's going to give us a CNM update. Thanks so much, Michelle. Okay, so um, just to give you kind of the state of affairs of what's been going on at the CNM, and this is um, all for fiscal year 22, as we are in fiscal year 23 right now. So I wanted to start with uh, showing you our management team. Um, of note, since last year, we have a new uh, safety coordinator. So our new coordinator is Jim Young. And um, I believe everybody else is the same since last year. Cheryl Mark would has, was recent, but I think she was here since last year. Uh, we continue to have our deputy group leaders and these folks, um, it is an educational opportunity for them to learn some of the responsibilities of the group leaders and to see if they like uh, management and would um, like to develop their careers in this way. They step in for the group leaders when group leaders are uh, away on travel or on vacation, et cetera. We have a DEI committee that was set up last year, and this includes our staff members, as well as Proga at the bottom right hand corner, who is a postdoc, and Elena Rushkova, who is the chair of this committee, resides on a directorate committee for the physical sciences and engineering directorate of which the CNM is a part of. 
um, that forms the PSE DEI committee. So she is the conduit to go back and forth between um, the CNM and the directorate level um, DEI items. Our user executive committee as of today is the following. And tomorrow we're going to hear from the chair, Badri Narayanan, and uh, we will be hearing some more um, user talks tomorrow. So please join us for our CNM plenary, which will be tomorrow morning. And just wanted to give you a couple of other highlights. Currently, oops, currently we are here in the um, plenary of uh, the CNM APS com combined plenary. Tomorrow morning is when we'll have the UEC update and a keynote address and a user address, April 18th, 10 a.m. Central Time. And then we have some APS CNM joint workshops and then also some CNM workshops as we go through the user meeting this week and the week of May 1 through 5. So a little bit on our user demographics. We are aligned with the APS in terms of our user calls. So we have three calls per year and we received approximately 400 proposals in fiscal year 22. And these are some of the statistics as they were split out into the different calls. Um, on our proposal evaluation board, we have about 130 members and fiscal year 22 with online reviews. This coming proposal cycle, we will be switching to panel reviews. So this proposal evaluation board uh, we will have different sets of people um, who have agreed to perform the evaluations online on Zoom, but in a panel format, which we think will be a much more equitable process for our users. And on a daily basis, we have about 300 proposals that are active. Connie Pfeiffer is here um, on the right as our user program manager, and Katie Teets is our user program coordinator. So you will likely be interfacing with one of these two ladies anytime you would like to submit a proposal or use the CNM. A little bit on our statistics for the user community. This past year, as you heard from Paul Kearns this morning in fiscal year 22, we had 756 users where 401 of them were on site and 355 were remote. In uh, the domestic users within the United States, we have about 50 7% from academia, and about 33% come from Argonne, about 4% from industry. And for the foreign users, about 68% come from academia. The demographics are the following. We have, um, as Paul stated this morning, we have users for fiscal year 22 from 36 states plus the District of Columbia. This map, however, is showing users for fiscal year 19 to 22. Um, and so it's, it's kind of an average over those three years. But what this highlights is that the majority of our users are from the state of Illinois, as we would expect, because we are serving the local community. Um, however, the surprising thing to me always is that we have users from the West Coast, our next set of largest number of users from the West Coast and the East Coast, as well as Texas. And then we have users from these other uh, states that are shown in blue here. Internationally, we had users from 12 countries in fiscal year 22. And this graph, again, is a compilation of fiscal year 19 to 22. And uh, the countries that we had users from are also written down, but also highlighted in green um, on, the, on the graph. So to the users in this audience, it is extremely important to us that you fill out your user survey because we use this information to make our center better and to provide the kinds of tools that you need. Our um, percentage of very satisfied or satisfied with the scheduled service, instrumentation performance, support provided by staff and support provided by scientific staff and then by admin and support staff are listed at the top left corner. What I would like to highlight is that we, as well as the APS, have these exemplary student research programs, which I'll touch on a little bit later. And these are groups of high school students that come in. 
And the APS um, has a larger number of students coming in, and then the CNM has a smaller number of students because of our relative sizes. But we really are setting the standard for um, the exemplary student research programs um, across Argonne. And also, uh, these comments that you submit in this survey enable us to know what you as the user community needs and be able to provide for those needs. So for example, at the bottom left, expansion and regular upgrades of equipment for time results spectroscopy would be very beneficial, particularly for researchers like me based at our two universities. And in the green above it, in the center, um, in one of the center sentences, it says that coming from a small university that lacks the high-end research tools, we depend on the CNM user facility for our research needs. So this is um, really one of the strongest goals of the CNM is that we are able to provide a little bit more equity to uh, bring training and tools for students from non-R1 universities and from minority serving institutions um, make it a little bit more equitable in terms of their education and um, competitiveness in the workforce moving forward. Some of our impact metrics, as you heard from Laurent, uh, we are seeing the same trend as APSs. Our publications this year were 289, and we probably had a peak roughly fiscal year 19 and 20, um, just as the pandemic was hitting. So um, now we are seeing the effects of that. So our publications are slightly down. However, of those publications, we have 55% in journals with the impact factor of greater than seven. We also use that um, impact factor greater than seven as uh, APS and other light sources and other nanoscale science research centers do. A similar trend in our patents, we are also um, Seeing eight is a small dip, but it's the lowest in many years since fiscal year 16, again, due, due to the impacts of the pandemic. Um, as Paul mentioned this morning, we celebrated our 15th anniversary. So we are now 15 years old, um, which was a fantastic celebration. And we have hosted one fellow from the DOE's Office of Science Graduate Student Research Program. And here's the students that I mentioned. The Exemplary Student Research Program, we had five groups of students, but there were 31 total students. So these high school students come in with a teacher in groups, and um, they're able to see research firsthand. And depending on the age of the students, um, they may be able to perform a little bit of the research themselves as well, with safety considerations all taken into account first, of course. Um, you will see Jay Shu at the bottom right. She was the star in our recent uh, video on Nanoscience 101. And at the top right, you'll see a little bit of what's on there. So what are nanostructures? And it, and it goes through this little diagram of um, nanoscale. What is nanoscale? And Jay also was selected by Newsweek magazine as one of America's 50 greatest disruptors. So uh, kudos to Jay, and we are certainly excited that she's here with us here at the CNM. A little bit about upgrades in our capabilities this year. Um, we were able to make these tools listed here available to the user community in fiscal year 22. And one of them um, that actually Jay is in charge of at the top right, you see is this uh, solution processing robot. So this, this robot is combined with AI and ML to be able to perform these experiments autonomously. It's one of our new robots. Uh, we, ha we have another one that hasn't become a user tool quite yet. It's in the state of um, getting getting installed and getting up to speed. But we're excited about our expanding autonomous capabilities. And I also wanted to highlight that since we have a lot more remote users now, we have 60 tools and 75 associated computers that are remotely accessible for tool operation and data analysis in fiscal year 22. In fiscal year 22. So this has enabled a lot of our research community to continue to do their research, even if they can't get here physically. 
in our recapitalization for fiscal year 22. So these are some, these are a few of the 12 new tools that we acquired using either our investment, our internal CNM dollars, or from our directorate, the Fiscal Sciences and Engineering Directorate, or from Argonne Funds, we were able to um, acquire 12 new tools. And this is some of them. And of, a, of importance is the cryo cooler for our hard X-ray nanoprobe that we um, operate jointly with the APS at sector 26 and a liquid helium recovery system for the CNM because everybody is really struggling with the low amounts of liquid helium right now. So we're trying to do a little bit of circularity and recycling within the CNM so that we can make more of our tools available for low temperature measurements. A little bit for fiscal year 23, you'll hear this in my talk next year, but we have um, done our, recapital our internal CNM recapitalization equipment process where we have staff um, submit proposals based upon the research needs and the user needs. And we also consult the user executive committee on these to provide input on the prioritization. And then we come up with a prioritized list. So our carbon cluster, our computing cluster will receive an upgrade this year. And we will be also acquiring a focused ion beam tool, um, which is a gallium uh, source ion beam tool because it is uh, our instruments that we have are very, very old and falling apart and no longer have service contracts. So we definitely needed to reinvest in that one. At the bottom, we have a reactive, reactive ion etcher and a rapid thermal annealer, a couple of tools that are going into our clean room that are being upgraded as well. As we have discussed, there is a major item of equipment and a NSRC upgrade that you heard about from Linda and from Paul this morning. These four tools are what is um, expected for our upgrade. The hope, I think the project is on time and the hope for installation is in the installed column. So we're hoping for two tools installed in 2024 and two tools installed in 2025. Um, and we do have another um, focused ion beam on the upgrade list here, but this is with a plasma focused ion beam. It's not with the gallium source. So this is going to be the first um, at the Center for Nanoscale Materials and, and the first at Argon. So we're excited about all of these capabilities for our users. Moving on briefly to scientific strategy, we have a scientific advisory committee, just like we have a user executive committee and these are the members for fiscal year 22. And our chair is Benai Dravid from Northwestern University. And we have a nice mix of folks from um, university industry and from um, other national laboratories. We have just updated our strategic themes. So we have these five, I will say updated, they're not exactly brand new because our previous three themes were similar, but these are a little bit more expanded and a little bit more forward looking um, in terms of nanoscale discovery for sustainable energy future. But we still have our quantum, our QIS uh, theme, which is quantum coherence by design. We have a theme surrounding interfaces assembly and fabrication for emergent properties. Ultrafast dynamics, which has been a strong suit for the CNM historically and non equilibrium processes. AIML accelerated analytics and automation. So, some of the um, robotics that I showed you earlier are in this theme, but we also use AIML for analyzing images um, and uh, have software that has been developed by our theory and modeling staff in this area. And we are cross-cutting all of these themes with all of our technical groups. So it will have expertise in synthesis, fabrication, characterization, and theory across all of these science themes. So I just wanna end by showing you three um, short, fast um, highlights. And if you are interested in learning more about these, please do go to the journal that is at the bottom left. So this one, was a nature publication from fiscal year 22. And this is in our QIS theme area, we're looking to create um, an ideal qubit platform. 
And this one was created by freezing neon gas to solid at low temperatures and then spraying electrons from a light bulb filament onto the solid. So the idea is to trap a single electron there and then that is the, um, the building block for, uh, it's a single qubit, which is the building block for quantum computers as you put all of these qubits together and um, get them to talk to each other through entanglement. So we are um, hoping that this could transform um, this has higher uh, coherence, it has fast operation, and we believe it will have large scalability. So the relaxation time was 15 microseconds, which doesn't sound like very long, but those of you in the QIS area know this is long, and phase coherence time over 200 nanoseconds. So we are excited about this research. The second one is um, published in Nature Communications in fiscal year 22. And it is on the left, you see a graphical summary of this Monte Carlo tree search reinforcement learning approach. Um, and what they did here was put predict and apply to cluster structure and dynamical stability for 54 different elemental systems and their alloys through this algorithm. And this was a nice collaboration that brought together the APS, the CNM, um, University of Illinois, as well as our sister NSRC, the CNMS at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And finally, um, to tie together the work that we do very strongly together with the APS is at our heart X-ray nanoprobe beamline at sector 26. Um, which is going to be even better after the upgrade in terms of uh, brightness and um, hopefully time resolution. So what was uh, shown here in this PNAS um, publication that you see at the bottom right-hand corner is to be able to do a first-of-a-kind laser-pumped X-ray nanodiffraction imaging capability that had 25 nanometer spatial resolution and 100 picosecond time resolution. And this is really important to tie in together with our ultra-fast theme and our ultra-fast um, expertise at the CNM with the new ultra-fast electron microscope, as well as the traditionally um, our historically strong program in ultra-fast laser spectroscopy. So please do take a look at this if this is of interest to you. So with that, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the update. Um, just uh, for the update, there's some exciting stuff going on at CNM. So thank you for that, Ilke. So we have reached the end of the combined plenary session. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we will see you this afternoon at the APS plenary session as well as throughout the next um, few couple of weeks. So this week and then the first week of May for the APS CNM user meeting. Thank you all again um, and see you all soon.